name is Jeffrey Stone, for those of you who don't know me, and um, I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker this afternoon, Tracy Mears, the Walton ha Hamilton Professor of Law at Yale University. Um, it's my opportunity to do this because when I served briefly as interim dean of the law school, I invited Tracy to come speak, and this is one of the benefits of that um, service. Uh, Tracy Mears received her JD right here at the University of Chicago Law School in 1991. And amazingly, probably for Tracy as well as for me, uh, this spring marks the 25th uh, anniversary of her graduation from the law school. It's okay, Tracy, don't look at it. Um, I happened to be with Professor Mears at a reception the other night for the John Howard Association, uh, a wonderful organization in Chicago that works to improve the quality of Illinois' prison system. And one of the guests there um, told me that Professor Mears had just informed her that after earning her undergraduate degree uh, from the University of Illinois in engineering, um, she was contemplating going to law school. But being an engineering student, she really didn't know very much about law school. And without much thought, she was at least tentatively planning to go to Georgetown. Uh, but according to the story, uh, the then dean of the University of Chicago Law School um, gave Tracy an offer, a quote, she couldn't refuse. Um, and so she wound up uh, serendipitously here as a student at the University of Chicago. And I'm pleased to say that I was that dean. <laughs> it was one of the best decisions I ever made as dean in terms of bringing people to the law school, with the exceptions, of course, of hiring Barack Obama and Elena Kagan. <laughs> Sorry, Tracy. <laughs> In any event, upon graduating from the law school, Professor Mears served as a law clerk for Judge Harlington Wood on the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, and she then spent several years working for the Department of Justice. She then returned to the University of Chicago Law School as an assistant professor, and then later served as the Max Pam Professor of Law and Director of the Law School's Center for Studies in Criminal Justice. Then, several years ago, in a moment of just awful judgment. <laughs> Professor Mears headed to some place called New Haven, <laughs> where she sadly remains pathetically to this day. <laughs> During her distinguished career, rooted deeply in this law school, Professor Mears has worked extensively, among other things, with the federal government. Um, from, 19, uh, sorry, from 2004 to 2011, for example, she served on the Committee on Law and Justice, a standing committee of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, in 2010, she was named by Attorney General Eric Holder to sit on the Department of Justice's newly created Science Advisory Board. And just last year, President Obama named her as a member of his task force on 20th, 21st century policing. Professor Muir's research focuses on criminal procedure and criminal law policy with a particular emphasis on empirical investigation. She's published a long list of influential scholarly articles and important books, including among them Legitimacy and Criminal Justice, a Comparative Perspective, and Urgent Times, Policing and Rights in Inner City Communities. At a time of widespread national concern about community safety, criminal justice, and police practices, Professor Tracy Mears is one of the most thoughtful, respected, and innovative scholars in the field. She is truly a national leader. And it is my pleasure to present my former student and my special friend, Professor Tracy Mears. Thank you, Jeff, for that generous introduction. I was honored to be asked by the leaders of the University of Chicago Legal Forum to give this keynote, and thrilled, really, uh, to become, be able to come back home. Um, Hyde Park has changed uh, in so many good ways, but I admit to feeling sad about the demise of ribs and bibs. The food wasn't great, but the sniffs were incomparable. Um, I thought a great deal about what I wanted to say today. Uh, my primary goal, actually, had to run back and get my prop, was to emphasize the hard work, great work, really, that I did with 10 of my other colleagues who ranged from police chiefs to young activists, to civil rights lawyers, to union representatives. And we all served together on the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. And this task force, as many of you know, was created in the wake of the shooting deaths 
of Michael Brown in Ferguson, and the death of Eric Garner in New York at the hands of New York City police. The president was especially concerned about the unrest that followed these incidents, and he stated, it's actually a quote that's on the back of, of this report, I'm going to read it, um, when any part of the American family does not feel like it's being treated fairly, that's a problem for all of us. It's not just a problem for some. It's not just a problem for a particular community or demographic. It means we're not as strong as a country as we can be. And when applied to the criminal justice system, it means we're not as effective in fighting crime as we could be. Our task force was charged with examining how to foster building strong collaborative relationships between law, local law enforcement and the communities they protect, and to make some very specific recommendations to the president on how policing practices can promote effective crime reduction while building public trust, a theme that you heard a little bit about today for those of you who are in the much colder room five. Um, <laughs> the first pillar of our report is called Building Trust and Legitimacy, and I think that's the foundation of good policing. So that's what I was going to talk about today, and I'm going to actually hit on that topic. But um, there's a slight detour, and that detour comes because I was just here last week, sadly not in Hyde Park. I was in town for the International Association of Chiefs of Police annual conference, and there I heard FBI Director James Comey speak at PERF. Um, that's the Police Executive Research Forum to Non-Insiders. Um, that's a, that PERF has an annual town meeting. And because I heard him speak at that um, gathering, I decided to shift the emphasis of my remarks a bit. Um, at that meeting, uh, Comey, who is, like me, an alum of this law school, um, he echoed there what he had said here um, just a few days before, maybe even in this room, I don't know. Um, he worried about a national spike in homicide, and he said, referring to a conversation that he said he had with an officer who told him that he felt, this officer felt, he was under siege because people are watching him with a cell phone, and this officer told Director Comey that he didn't feel like getting out of his car. I'm going to quote Director Comey. He said, I don't know whether this explains it, and the it, presumably, he's talking about the national spike in homicide entirely, but I do have a strong sense that some part of the explanation is a chill wind blowing through American law enforcement over the last year, and that wind is surely changing behavior. That wind is surely changing behavior. Now I'm going to leave aside for the moment whether there really is a national surge in homicide that we need to explain at all, and whether even if there were that whether this national, even if there were this national trend, whether there is any reliable, serious data that there is a change in police behavior as opposed to anecdotal reports of understandable changes in feelings and attitudes of police who are now being more closely scrutinized than ever before. That could be partially responsible for this change. I'm happy to return to both of these topics. But here's what I'd like to focus my remarks on today, and that is that I think the public safety narrative has lost its way. It needs to be redirected and reshaped. And that's why I chose the provocative title. I don't even know if any of you know my title, but Ruby Garrett told me I had to have a provocative title. <laughs> or a C-SPAN. Um, <laughs> my title is Against Public Safety, and for public security. Now let me explain. The President's task force report makes public trust central to the mission of policing, and the question is, how do we do it? The public safety narrative, and by that I mean the narrative that makes what police do, the number of police, particular police strategies, where police go, absolutely central to crime reduction, I'll call it police effectiveness, suggests that public support for police is directly related to the public's evaluations of police effectiveness. This turns out not to be the case. You might find that surprising today in a world in which there's so much discussion of police effectiveness in media policy circles and the like. Comey's remarks, I think, reflect this. <laughs> The notion of a Ferguson effect itself suggests that there is a crisis that we might need 
such that we might need to sacrifice police um, effectiveness at crime reduction for, as, in, in order to fulfill our concern about police accountability, lawfulness, etc. Now, it might surprise some of you in this room who are under the age of 30, and Jeff has totally outed me. I can't even pretend that I'm under the age of 30, 30 anymore. Thanks, Jeff. It might surprise you to learn that the idea of police effectiveness at crime reduction, that is a metric that should matter with respect to evaluation of police, is actually a metric of relatively recent vintage. For decades, decades, many scholars of policing and police themselves believe that law enforcement actually had little impact on crime rates. Venerable police scholar David Bailey, who several in this room actually know well and has worked with, summed up this view nicely in his 1994 book, Police for the Future. And I'm going to quote, The police do not prevent crime. That is one of the best kept secrets of modern life. Experts know it. The police know it. But the public does not know it. Yet, the police pretend they are society's best defense against crime and continually agree that if they're given more resources, especially personnel, they will be able to protect communities against crime. This is a myth. Now today, of course, police executives are expected and expect themselves to reduce crime in their jurisdictions. Policing's potential to impact crime rates is conventional wisdom, actually, thanks in large part to the work of folks in this room, like David Weisberg, where is he? There's David. Um, Frank Zimmering, also, there he is, right there, sitting right next to David. Thank you. And other folks across the Midway, like Steve Levitt, whom some of you know. However, as my colleague Tom Tyler noted in his testimony before the task force a few months ago, while police seemingly have become better and better over time at reducing and addressing crime, surveys indicating levels of public support for and confidence in police have remained relatively flat over the same period of time in which crime rates have fallen precipitously. And so if perceptions of trust and confidence were grounded in assessments of police effectiveness, this isn't what we should be finding, right? So one might ask then, if police effectiveness doesn't drive public trust, what does? Another answer might be police lawfulness. Again, in light of repeated incidents of quite shocking police brutality, consider here the tragic death of Walter Scott in North Charleston, South Carolina, who was shot in the back by a police, white police officer as he fled. We might think that commitment to the rule of law, and especially constitutional constraints that shape engagements between the public and the police would support public trust. And of course, police compliance with the law is a critical component of a legitimate state. Now, there are a couple problems with how to think about that relationship and public trust. One, of course, is whether we have an objective measure of police lawfulness. We heard a little bit about that today in Frank Zimmering's report about how we um, count police or civilian deaths at the hands of police. He gave us some very interesting data about that. I think there's a general sense, and here I'm not relying on data, that if you look at the period of time over which crime has declined, many people probably think that um, there's a much higher level of police lawfulness today than there used to be. There was an NRC report that seemed to indicate that that came out about 10 years ago. I collaborated again with some people in this room on that report. I'm not as confident of our assessment uh, of, of that uh, conclusion based on recent events. But here's another issue with thinking about the relationship between police lawfulness and assessments of public trust. And that comes out of my own research, again with Tom Tyler and Jacob Gardner. And our work demonstrates that public judgments of police legitimacy, assessments of how the public thinks about whether police are doing a good job, are not really that sensitive to whether police are behaving consistently with constitutional law, in fact. Because the public doesn't define lawfulness or determine sanctioning through the same lens of legality that police and other legal authorities use. Now this piece, this research that I'm talking about is, is forthcoming in the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology and it's called Lawful or Fair, How Cops and Lay People View Good Policing. We have some empirical evidence, right, showing that there's this, this, this juncture. 
So if our goal <coughs> is promotion of public trust, then we have to recognize that while both police effectiveness at crime reduction and police lawfulness are both relevant, neither alone is sufficient. I think the public safety narrative lost its way when many of its major advocates began to argue that police effectiveness, police effectiveness at crime reduction has become self-justifying. That police effectiveness at crime reduction is a warrant for itself. It's not. We need a new narrative, and I've decided to emphasize the word security as opposed to safety. There may be a better phrase. Maybe you don't like security. But here's the primary point. We need a mission statement for policing that recognizes that people desire to be kept safe from each other, security against private predation, as well as be free from government repression, security against government overreach. And that pursuit of both at the same time is not a zero-sum game. How to achieve both? I think the answer is fairly clear, or at least part of the answer, and that is with, with and through a commitment to policing that makes legitimacy and procedural justice central to its mission. Now, you're going to learn much more about this research and these ideas when Tom Tyler uh, summarizes his paper, so I'm not going to take his thunder, and also this will give us more time for questions at the end. But I'm going to sketch out a few basic points here now. And here's the basic theory. People's conclusions regarding their assessment of the fairness of legal actors, institutions, and law does not flow, really, or primarily, from their assessments of the police effectiveness at tasks such as crime reduction or apprehension of wrongdoers. People tend to make, place much more weight on how authorities exercise their power, power as opposed to the ends for which that power is exercised. And researchers have studied public evaluations of police officers, judges, political leaders, managers, teachers, and the findings are pretty consistent. Conclusions concerning legitimacy are tied much more closely to judgments of the fairness of the actions of these actors than to evaluations or fairness of the effectiveness of the outcomes. So um, in the social psychological literature, judgments regarding fairness depend on four factors primarily. First, participation or voice is an important element. <coughs> People report much higher levels of satisfaction in encounters with authorities when they have opportunities to explain their per perspective on those encounters. This is also true as you generalize up. So participation and opportunities to engage in strategies, to have commentary on lawmaking and so forth, all of these things are general examples of voice. Second, People care a great deal about the fairness of decision-making by authority. And by this, I mean they're looking to indicia of decision-maker neutrality, objectivity, and factuality, transparency, consistency. Third, people care a great deal about how they're treated by an organization's leaders and representatives. Specifically, people desire to be treated with respect for their rights and politeness. And fourth, in their interactions with authorities, people want to believe that the authorities that they are dealing with are acting out of a sense of benevolence toward them. By this I mean what people are looking for is a sense of the motives of the authorities that they're, looking, that they're dealing with. They want to believe that they're sincere and well-intentioned. Basically, what members of the public want is to believe that the authority that they are dealing with, let's say a police officer, believes that they count. I'll repeat that again. If I'm a member of the public and I'm dealing with a police officer, I want to believe that that police officer believes that I count, even if, of course, that officer doesn't really believe that. Right? That's kind of the trick part um, about this. 
that it's all about my perceptions, your perceptions, the public's perceptions. And the way that we operate in the world is that we're making these assessments by evaluating how we're treated in these interactions. These dynamics are inherently relational. They're not instrumental. Right? Rather than being primarily concerned with outcomes and individual maximization of utility, and I am saying that in this room, <laughs> legitimacy-based compliance is centered on individual identity. Okay, there's a lot more to be said about that and why that's true. I don't actually have time to go into that. Maybe we can talk about it at the end. And as I said, I'm sure Tom is going to talk more about that this afternoon. But here's one implication of this. is what police generate good feelings in their everyday context. It turns out that people are motivated to help them fight crime. And we can expect that when they are, that low, there will be lower crime rates in communities. But this isn't the only benefit of this approach, right? Another approach and benefit of authorities treating members of the public with dignity and fairness is more healthy and democratic communities. And finally, if that weren't enough, um, the research actually shows that when officers take this approach, it is better and healthier for them on the street. So how do we get there? The President's Task Force made a number of recommendations. I'm going to highlight just a few of them, but I do encourage you to read this report. There are a large number of important, concrete, doable recommendations, actually, and it's going to take all of us working together to get these um, recommendations implemented and make a change. So first, the task force recommended that law enforcement agencies embrace what we call a guardian mindset in order to promote public trust and legitimacy. Now, this recommendation encapsulates the thinking of another task force member whose name is Sue Rare. She was a sheriff in Washington State for a very long time. And she's written that officers must make a shift from a warrior mindset to a guardian mindset. We might think that the warrior mindset is about crime reduction at all costs, right? No. <laughs> guardian mindset is different. The guardian mindset um, actually emphasizes the behaviors that are consistent with procedural justice and legitimacy, among other things. Importantly, this is going to be a cultural change that has both internal and external aspects to it, and that police officers will have to be treated with procedural justice within their own organizations if we're going to expect them to carry out this kind of behavior on the street. I think this recommendation is actually a tall order. Um, as I said, it requires organizational change in agencies. It requires policing agencies to change the way the officers are trained. Subsidiary strategies include diversifying the workforce. Our policing agencies need more women, more educated officers, more people of color, training on de-escalization techniques and CIT training, I think, are a must. I could go on. I also think outside of a place like Chicago, um, force consolidation is also necessary. We have 18,000 different agencies. Many of them are very, very small. You can't implement this kind of change in a very tiny agency. So one of the recommendations that we make in this report is that agencies should be encouraged to consolidate to at least 50 officers or more. Second, the task force recommended that agencies acknowledge the role of policing in past and present injustice and discrimination and how it's a hurdle to the promotion of community trust. I don't think this recommendation can be emphasized enough, and we actually talked about it today in one of the earlier panels. There have been really powerful and poignant examples of practices whereby police officials and members of affected communities have come together for conversations about dueling narratives that undermine trust. And they're really incredibly moving accounts of individual officers making decisions to acknowledge these past transgressions of those in uniform before them. Here's one story I want to talk about in particular that makes the point, I think, really well. There is a police chief, he's no longer police chief anymore, 
in Montgomery, Alabama. His name is Kevin Murphy. He was born a year after Representative John Lewis and the Freedom Riders famously traveled to Montgomery, where they were brutally and viciously beaten by a white mob and then went to a church in Montgomery that literally sits across the street from the police headquarters in Montgomery, Alabama today. It wasn't then, but it is now where um, they were firebombed in the church, electricity lines were cut to the church, again, the police nowhere to be found. And one spring day in 2013, Chief Murphy was part of a delegation that welcomed Representative Lewis back to Montgomery. And in front of a large crowd, the chief said to Representative Lewis, I want to apologize. We, the Montgomery police, failed to protect you and the other Freedom Riders in 1961. The Montgomery police were not very good to you, but today we're a better department. And he went on and explained the kinds of things they were doing and so on and so forth. And you might think that that's the end of the story, but then he takes his badge and he says, this badge is is a representation of service and protection, and in particular, promotion of individual constitutional rights of members of the public. And in 1961, my colleagues were not worthy to wear this badge, but you were, and I want you to have it now. He takes it off and gives it to him. And this was this amazing moment. You could actually YouTube it and, and see it on, on, um, on the net. It, it was, it's pretty powerful. It's obviously an incredibly powerful act of symbolic reconciliation. The question is how to do this work in large scale. But it's necessary, and we recall that a critical component of procedural justice is motive-based trust, and it's extremely difficult for people who have been treated poorly as a group and individually to expect benevolent treatment, right? So extraordinary acts like apologies and reparative strategies are necessary and likely not sufficient, and certainly proceeding as if the past never happened, as Professor Craig Futterman noted today in his presentation before the symposium group, is not an option. Third, I want to return to where I began, and that is, it is imperative that policing agencies recognize that crime reduction is not self-justifying. Police action taken for the purpose of making communities safer, especially aggressive police action, can have the counterproductive result of destroying the very reservoir of trust on which communities and policing agencies depend for proper functioning. So the idea promoted by folks like Ray Kelly and Rudy Giuliani and maybe even Mayor Form, former Mayor Bloomberg that we ought to somehow balance the benefits that groups of people such as African Americans and young African American men in particular receive from plummeting crime rates without truly acknowledging the cost to them in terms of enforcement. And here I'm not just talking about incarceration. It's short-sighted and deeply, deeply flawed. And it's because their argument's premise is that aggressive policing is necessary to achieve crime reduction. That's just false. And critical to understand here is that promotion of public trust is actually associated with voluntary compliance with the law. This means that policing agencies can achieve their goal of enhancing public safety while at the same time pursuing the mandate of increasing public trust through greater commitment to legitimacy and procedural justice. Now, while the prescription, I think, is relatively straightforward, the process of taking the medicine is not. One might imagine the old treatment for rabies, and I'm probably dating myself, but when I was a kid, the treatment for rabies was 21 shots in the abdomen over three weeks. Now, I understand that's no longer the case. I think now it's like five shots in the arm, but when I was a kid, we were all sort of terrified by the specter of the rabies shots in the gut, and I'm afraid of dogs to this day because of the rabies treatment. I think that the path to police reform will be something like this. A narrow prescription that we all understand it's clear, that's difficult to endure, but worth it, because the alternative 
literally, is death. Change will be painful for policing organizations. There will be resistance. There already is. Path dependency is strong. There is a sense of righteousness. Change will be difficult for the affected communities, especially communities of color. Think of disadvantaged neighborhoods in Baltimore, for example, who've long distrusted police, or the kids that Craig Futterman was talking about today. There will be resistance. There already is. Path dependency is strong. There is a sense of righteousness. So why should we be hopeful about this? Well, there are all sorts of examples of changes on at foot. In fact, a primary example happened just in this state, in Illinois. Um, Governor Rauner, as I understand it, has signed the omnibus police reform legislation that was passed almost unanimously by both houses. And this is a 135-page bill. I don't know if any of you have looked at it. It's got all kinds of stuff in it. Um, a requirement for this kind of police training on procedural justice, implicit bias. It's got regulation on body cameras. It even requires that every police officer, when they stop a person, give that person a receipt that has the officer's name, badge number, and the reason for the stop. Jeff, data. There's new requirements um, in Massachusetts for training like this. The Attorney General of California has required wholesale training of every policing agency in the state. The New York Police Department has recently announced that it will begin to document every single use of force, including the kind of force used in stops. There is movement and response to the national conversation. But I think we need deeper change. If you go to the website of the Invisible Institute, organized by Jamie Calvin, you'll see videos of a handful of teens recounting their experiences with Chicago police. Some of you, if you were in the symposium room today, have already seen some of these videos. And um, Craig Futterman, who teaches at this law school, refers and describes to the world that the kids live in, that they describe, as one governed by an alternative constitution. Now that description resonates with me. I think we're in the midst of a national moment right now, one in which we are trying to understand and work toward the terms of citizenship in a very real way that neither the first nor the second reconstructions achieved, even though those reconstructions may have provided the legal architecture for doing so. So the Constitution, through the Reconstruction Amendments, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, and con that's the first Reconstruction, obviously, um, and Congress, through the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, the second Reconstruction, provided what we might think of as a formal curriculum of citizenship. These laws tell us who we are by how we value freedoms of all individuals. In an article that I've written with um, a colleague, Ben Justice, in the annals last year, we wrote a piece called How the Criminal Justice System Educates Citizens. Um, Benjamin is a historian of education, and he introduced me to a literature that talks about how students are treated in classrooms, that makes this distinction between the formal curriculum on the one hand and the hidden curriculum on the other. And so I was really moved by Craig's work with these teens because it really reflected this idea of the dichotomy between the formal curriculum on the one hand and the hidden curriculum on the other. This idea of the hidden curriculum comes from these educational researchers who look at how classrooms are organized, who are the mascots, where the kids sit in the lunchroom, who is called on or who is not in civics class. When the hidden curriculum clashes with the formal curriculum, we're provided with instruction about who is and who is not a citizen. Citizens are those whose treatment by a legal authority is completely consistent with the formal curriculum of rights. Those whose treatment is not consistent, their hidden curriculum is totally different. We might even say that those folks 
are, we, we get instruction on who the anti-citizen is. Some have said that we are actually in the nascent moments of a third reconstruction. I hope so. I'd like to think that this time we'll get it right. But how do we do that? Well, one answer might be to rely on this idea about the distinction between the formal curriculum on the one hand and the hidden curriculum on the other. And once we have a system in which the formal and hidden curricula are the same for everyone, then we will have achieved the goal of the third reconstruction. So let's hope that we are on the path to its achievement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I should say that part of the reason why I use the term security actually is that there's, a, there's another literature in the UK, um, and I'm referring to the work of Neil Walker and Ian Loder, who've written a book called Civilizing Security. Um, and what they're actually trying to do is what I'm trying to do in the context of public safety. They're trying to subvert the narrative about security, the very narrative that you're talking about, to encompass a greater acknowledgement of not only individual rights, but an understanding of the way in which state agents actually constitute who we are um, as citizens. So, you know, I'm doing a little bit of, um, of, of triage here by saying, you know, at least in the, the domestic policing context, if we talk about people feeling secure in their persons, right, um, that will acknowledge the role that government can play in creating insecurity at, through their pursuit of public safety. But, you know, I, I get what you're saying. Um, rather than just criticizing me, how about come on, coming up with a, a new word? This is your idea. Okay. I'd be curious to hear what maybe the task force has worked on or what your personal thoughts are on how this should be reflected in the, in the school system, specifically with, within the disciplinary structure, especially looking at cases like what happened in South Carolina recently yeah. with the use of force and uh, other um, more uh, punitive measures in schools. Yeah, so um, I was emphasizing in my remarks primarily the first pillar of the report, which is about building uh, trust and confidence and legitimacy. And that pillar basically was the foundation for um, the five other pillars um, that we talked about. I can just review them really quickly. The second one is policy and oversight. The third is technology and social media. The fourth is community policing and crime reduction. Five is training ed and education. And six is officer safety and wellness. Um, Pillar four on community policing has a lot of recommendations about what you're talking about, like you know, the kinds of collaborations that um, policing agencies can and should undertake in schools. We heard a great deal of testimony um, about um, trying to reduce the number of arrests that um, come out of the school context. Um, the de-escalation conversation was consistent with that, talking about kids as vulnerable populations, understanding that the first interactions that teens have with um, police 
actually are, are formative relationships that actually um, tell, you know, make pr predictions about how they're going to view both police and the law in, in the future. But, um, you know, there are pages and pages of, of this, and, um, you know, I'd, I'd recommend that you um, take, take a look. Hello. I was uh, quite taken by your notion of police as guardians. I was somewhat less optimistic about the ability of the society to reach that understanding. It seems to me, and you of course talked a bit about this, what we have to do is change culture. And I don't see how we do that without incentives. And I'm not sure that altruism is notion that, boy, we can't let things go on the way they have been are sufficient, particularly if what is underlying at least part of the concern here is race. There was a talk earlier this week by the head of Chicago Police Board, and there was an interesting question from an LLM from Germany who said, well, in Germany, all police officers have to have a four-year university degree. Yeah. Now, I would say, wonderful. We're going to increase taxes to pay for that, particularly if we live in nice white suburbs where we don't have to worry about this. So, so <coughs> give me some reason for optimism about why I shouldn't be skeptical that we do not yet have a commitment to expand the resources that I think will be necessary to change culture. Yeah, there are so many different um, ways to get at that, and I'm going to say three, maybe four things, not necessarily in order and may not be completely coherent. Um, but here's the first, and that is, you know, training, 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 right? I, I think that, you know, one way to get from warrior to guardian is to have fundamental um, change in police training. And certainly the largest agencies in the country are focused on this task. So you might not actually be experiencing it, on, on the street yet here in Chicago, but I can tell you that um, the training on procedural justice here is, is, is very innovative. It's the, you know, Chicago is a leader in doing it. They've trained over 12,000 officers and, and the first eight hour module, and I don't know how many thousand they've done for the second, and implicit <coughs> bias is on the way. Um, the New York Police Department has, is required to reform their training out of the Floyd litigation, um, and that reform is, is underway. And I know in part that it is underway because I'm working with them, uh, with other people, to do that. Um, and there are many recommendations about that in um, Pillar 5 of, of the report. You say, okay, but resources, right? Because New York and Chicago, while tons and tons of officers, New York has about 38,000. Um, we, I, have, I said we, Chicago uh, has about 12,000. Um, you know, that's a drop in the bucket when we're talking about the entire landscape of, of American policing. I think if we're going to have this change, we need two things to happen. First, the post requirements of every state to certify police officers have to actually adopt these changes and make them a requirement. So that's one. That's a, that's a legal change. And second, there have to be the resources to actually implement um, this, this kind of, of training wholesale. It's going to be hard to do without some kind of force consolidation. So that's one of the reasons why we recommended that in the report. Now, how does that happen? You might think that one way you do consolidation is to give agencies incentives to become bigger, you know, with the lure of federal dollars. Turns out that fewer than half of the 18,000 policing agencies get any money from the Department of Justice at all, so why would that be an incentive? It won't be. So it's going to require some kind of incentive, I think, um, given by the executive leadership of every state, right, like a you know, governor who sort of encourages the municipalities to consolidate. How does that happen? Maybe there's a federal... Um, um, carrot given to the governors where you say, look, I'm going to give you more federal dollars, you state, in order to get this done. And then, you know, we've got the regular politics that happen. So, you know, I don't know. So in that sense, I, I, I'm not super hopeful. But 
I will say that, you know, this change of the whole warrior mentality, that's relatively new too. You know, that shift happened in, in the context of policing agencies believing that this is what they could do. Right? They didn't used to believe that. That's why I started um, the, the, the talk with, you know, with the Bailey anecdote. And so I think with all the scrutiny, with the litigation, with the fact that every police chief, at least of a major city, you know, understands that they have to, I'm going to say this on C-SPAN, I hope this is okay, shovel everybody else's shit all the time, right? Like they're expected to solve the discipline problems in schools. They're expected to deal with the fact that we had the institutionalization of, of, of institutions and, you know, there are some, some serious issues of mental illness on the street. They're expected to deal with people battling the disease of addiction publicly and, and in the streets because nobody else is dealing with it. And so they are constantly looking for innovative responses, right? Um, they're motivated. So I think there is reason for hope. Uh, I wanted to tell you that uh, on November 19th, which is uh, two days away, our group, the Illinois Academy of Criminology, is going to have a forum on your 21st century report. Uh, Sean Smoot from your group will be there. And we also have David Ader, who's a member of our academy, who uh, is going to go into the history of the police. And if you look at that history, uh, David briefed me a little on what he's going to say, there was the Posse Comitatus, and even Robert Peel's institution of the police, the Bobbies, named for him, in England, depended on a sense of community, that the police come from the community. And I think it'll be interesting to review the findings of your task force uh, against the light of a police history that few people know about or look into. I did want to say that our group was founded by Ernest Burgess in 1950, who was a sociologist professor here at the University of Chicago who pioneered the application of social science to uh, criminal justice studies. We had Hans Modig and Norval Morris was one of our past presidents. He was the dean of this law school and a prominent criminologist. We're a bunch of old people but we like to look at these things historically. I look forward to what happens in our review of your report against the historical background, and thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, in spite of all the efforts to shift from warrior to guardian mentality, no matter how the post-certification requirements have changed, whatever training takes place, there are going to be some officers who don't get the message or refuse to get the message. So my question leads to the disciplinary process. In many jurisdictions, mandatory uh, binding arbitration is the means of resolving disciplinary disputes, especially discharge of officers. And a very common pattern is for an arbitrator hearing a discharge grievance filed by an officer to say, yes, the officer is guilty, he did X, but it's really not such a big deal how can put them back to work. Uh, just recently, when the city of Boston attempted to have uh, a court order set aside an arbitration decision, they were unsuccessful. The officer has been fired three times for three separate offenses, and each time reinstated to duty by an arbitrator. Hmm. Uh, and there have, of course, been civil litigations relative to the underlying incidents, which have cost the city of Boston and its taxpayers substantial change. <laughs> So my question is, did the commission give any consideration to these issues of how police disciplinary cases are adjudicated and how the process can be made more effective? I could give you a whole laundry list of horror stories of officers who have been put back to work by arbitrators with no question as to the guilt. It's just a question of disagreement as to the penalty. Right. Uh, apparently in Cincinnati, uh, two officers who, uh, on duty, took a very intoxicated women, woman, in, escorted her back to her apartment, and then had sex with her. They were fired, and an arbitrator, two arbitrators, separate cases, two officers, concluded no big deal, three-day suspension, put them back to work. Hmm. Okay. 
so um, the <laughs> uh, you know the question was did we consider discipline per in particular um, in the recommendations and the answer is not with that level of specificity although we did um, hear testimony and take testimony on the relationship between disciplinary procedures. I'm talking, Jeff. <laughs> um, disciplinary procedures and also, um, you know, these ideas of procedural justice and legitimacy where you would think, right, that um, having more community input and certain kinds of accountability might be inconsistent with the kind of union demands, I think, that lead to these kinds of structures that you're talking about. We did talk about um, things that were related. So the fact that many police boards um, operate in the way that you're talking about. So a police executive will want to fire a police officer for um, an ex um, egregious behavior, and then a police board will reinstate um, that officer. And um, that was an example that we used a bit, uh, to point out the, the complications of civilian oversight, where civilian oversight is often takes place in the form of the police board that simply reviews these kinds of decisions and is not actively involved in setting policy um, and articulating community goals and projects in the way that, for example, um, the the board, in, which is not called the board, I'm not exactly sure what it's called in Los Angeles. The Los Angeles version of the police board is not just reviewing um, particular police decisions or, or executive decisions. Um, but, you know, I think you're pointing out this issue of discipline and the like is um, a jumping off point for me to say that while there's a lot of good stuff in there, um, we did this report in 57 days. 57 days. So um, the chairs were appointed in December 1st. The rest of the committee or the task force was appointed on December 19th. We started our work on January 13th, and it was an all-out sprint. Um, we had 150 witnesses who testified before us in certain hearings. We had hundreds of pages of written testimony and put together what I think is a pretty good document in that time period. But, you know, it, it's, it's not enough. It's not complete. It, um, you know, there are many, many other things to, to say and be said. And um, I think the other point to bring up is this idea it's a, that you're bringing up, it also Craig did too, this idea of, of, of accountability, I think, is a critical aspect of, of building uh, trust, right? You're not going to, to trust agencies or individuals in the context of agencies who aren't held accountable for, for wrongdoing. So we definitely have to figure that out. One more question. Um, so I'm very interested in how you're defining the role of police as, um, from a perspective of guardianship. And it makes me wonder if, for, if there's any policy initiatives that seek to, rather than you know, having police shovel everyone's crap, um, having uh, you know, the social services that are necessary instead take the role. So are there any policy solutions that are actually being played out or considered that would reroute some of these resources to things like mental health services, municipal services, better schools, not shutting down schools, and other things that might get to yeah. the source of the, the, the needs of the Right. So um, I, I should say that there were two overarching recommendations in, in the report um, that your comment um, makes me think that I, I should point out right now. Um, and, and one of them was um, a recommendation that the president a form, a, form another crime commission, um, that we basically haven't had an overall review of the criminal justice system since 1967. And, you know, it's about time. Right? So, so that was one. Uh, but the second is, and I'm going to read this, the president should promote programs that take a comprehensive and inclusive look at community-based initiatives that address the core issues of poverty, education, health, and safety. And that's what, that, that's what you're talking about. And um, so you know, our, our focus was pretty narrow, so we couldn't do everything. But we did talk about things such as, I'll give you an example, having 911 triage. Right. And by that I mean, if you get a 911 call 
um, where it appears that the incident is involving an individual who is suffering from mental disability. In some cities, they'll shift that call to a group of 911 receivers who actually have special training to deal with and ask the right questions um, so that the right resources, to the extent that they exist, and they don't in all cities, right, are then deployed to that situation. Because a lot of times, you know, what you have are people receiving calls who don't have adequate training, who then deploy people who don't have adequate training to situations that could be completely avoided in a situation where there was training, right? Um, uh, you know, one final point on this. You take a place like the UK, where, yes, I know, they don't, there aren't as many guns, et cetera, but, you know, they have a kind of over, the, the police there um, have an overarching um, sort of motto about preservation of life at all costs, right? When you are, when an officer is, is sent to a situation, I'm not talking about in custody deaths there, which is another um, another issue, but if you had a person with a mental disability um, who, you know, is facing an officer with a weapon or the like, you know, most of the officers there, as I understand it, are trained to simply slow the situation down. You go get the sandwiches, I'll go get the coffee, and we'll wait the person out. I mean, and that's just not what happens here, because, in part because our officers aren't trained properly and also because the people who dispatch them don't ask the right questions, and that's a start. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you.